Hello YouTube, this is Frank from Architectural Aesthetics. The content of today's video is a continuation of our previous episode as we will still be looking at using Photoshop Actions to speed up our post-production workflow. The project we're working on today is still the virtual reality pad project I mentioned in the previous video and the techniques we looked at in that video are still true in this one in the sense that we're still exploiting Photoshop actions to save time during texture overlaying and drop shadow creating process so if you're interested in this technique please refer to that video which is more informative and more instructional and I'll be putting a link to it in the description now after publishing the last video, I got a question regarding the purpose of doing texture overlay in Photoshop, which I think is a very valid question. So the question was, why didn't I apply the concrete materials to the geometries and render the image in V-Ray in the first place? To which my answer is from more of a technical standpoint because the project itself is quite imaginary and fantastical. So therefore, my geometry is of a quite unconventional shape, and to make the texture mapping over the whole structure looking convincing throughout, I foresaw that I had to do a lot of splitting and patching to break down the valid polysurface down to myriad small pieces, and just spend a lot of time tweaking the wrapping methods individually. All these steps I didn't really care for getting myself into because at the end of the day, we're architectural designers, not 3D artists. And I think that as long as we can effectively communicate the scale, the mood, and the space, the material for design, it's really self-defeating to spend too much time on a render, which is only icing on the cake when it comes to communicating your ideas to your clients. And when it comes to rendering methods, there are just so many approaches to choose from. On the one hand, we have the traditional render engines that are currently dominating the commercial market. And for students, hobbyists, Photoshop is still very popular when it comes to still images rendering. And for some of the more tech-savvy firms, real-time render using game engine is slowly gaining traction. And even newer technologies such as Modelo, which uses the WebGL technology to render 3D models in browsers and output that to VR headsets, is just threatening to disrupt the whole industry. And speaking of disruptive technology, even if we limit our scope down to Photoshop, the amount of innovation we have seen in the past few updates is just astounding. I mean, the healing brush tool on the mobile platform is already putting a lot of professional photography studios out of work, and the latest subject selection tool where you can just select objects of interest in a photo with one single click just defies how generations of people have been using Photoshop. I still remember how tough it was for me to learn how the pen tool behaves, and now it looks like, given some time for the subject selection tool to refine its algorithms, using pen tool to lasso complex objects is about to be obsolete. So what does this mean to us designers? Well, I would like to share with you a piece of advice from one of my former teachers named Eric Wong. He told me that you should always be eager to learn new softwares. And the reasoning behind this is that architecture as a discipline, as an industry, has always been heavily influenced and actively borrowing from other disciplines. Case in point is how Frank Gehry uses the software, which was originally developed for the purpose of airplane designing to aid his work. And sometimes if you don't take the time to learn something, it's very easy to just give up or just surrender to all the fear mongering. I remember I was chatting with my colleague regarding the recent deep fake issue, which is the advent of this new software that first interpolates a pornographic footage down to a sequence of still images and then sifts through a huge library of photographs of a certain female celebrity and then matches and merges the celebrity's face onto the porn star and finally re-render the tempered images into a new video, which can look quite authentic. And for the uninitiated, this certainly sounds very troublesome, even a little bit scary. But once you understood how the software operates, it helps alleviate some of the fear. 
I mean, sure, if this technology matures and were to be deployed in our industry, the guy in your office who specializes in entourage photoshopping would be definitely out of a job. But I seriously doubt that you and I are in this game just to photoshop people onto images. And back to the topic of how one should always be eager to learn new softwares. Does this mean that you've got to be chasing all the new softwares and string yourself to be proficient in every single one of them? Certainly not. And truth be told, after you have mastered the fundamentals of one software, you can probably pick up another one that has the similar functionalities in no time. I feel like what's more important is always artistry and the attention to detail, because at the end of the day, guys, a digital sculptor. Who can sculpt amazing figures in ZBrush can probably demonstrate the same level of mastery in Mudbox, even though many say that ZBrush is a superior software. And lastly, I think the ultimate goal for young designers should be improving their leadership skills and teamwork skills, so that given that they understood the bare bone essentials of the boundaries of what all the major computer programs can do. They can always go out and amass a group of talented people to produce excellent works as a team. So, alright, guys, that's all I have to say in this video. Please comment and subscribe to the channel, and I will see all of you in this Sunday's video. Bye bye.